Well, thank you uh, for the opportunity to, to speak today um, and about one of my favorite topics, uh, peripheral populations. And I guess today I'll be talking um, maybe relative to other speakers in the uh, session um, more about underlying processes or biology of um, peripheral populations. So when I was a grad student, um, this was an influential paper for me. This is um, Leskin Allendorf's uh, paper about you know why peripheral populations may be valuable for conservation. I think maybe this question is becoming more and more new as um, as people are appreciating peripheral populations more these days. But the, the essence of their argument boiled down to this figure, I would say, which shows on the y-axis isolation on the x-axis we have environmental differences in which uh, you know selection may be acting on populations. And they proposed that the highest value of populations uh, could be found in the upper right here, where we have high isolation and high environmental difference. And therefore, um, peripheral populations, if they're experiencing those um, attributes uh, from the environment and from selection, could be really unique and different, right? Um, I like to say that you know we still don't really have much of a functional understanding of this um, in nature, and we still don't really know whether this is quite true. So there's a lot of research to be done on this, but it, it definitely um, uh, drove a lot of my interest. It's a great paper. Um, and so, so some of the questions I like to address today, and I address in my research, um, are one: Are peripheral populations really different from central populations? Right? And different how? You know, they can be different in lots of ways. And second, what happens at range limits, or what causes them? And this is the second question is much more difficult to answer. What causes a species range limit? It's really difficult. And what I found in studying monkey flowers um, for over 10 years now is that I could probably spend the rest of my life on one species trying to answer what causes its range limits. It's not, and, and you know, as, as things change rapidly um, with uh, human effects, um, probably more and more the answer to that question for a lot of species is going to be human-driven causes are, are affecting their range limits. So just an overview today, I'm going to be sort of weaving around um, several monkey flower stories. Um, the cut-leaf monkey flowers in particular, I'll be talking about um, species range attributes, phenotypes, and adaptation we find in these monkey flowers. Um, then I'll switch into patterns that we see in peripheral populations and what implications these may have for the causes underlying their range limits, um, and then have some conclusions. Lots of questions usually I can conclude with. Um, so here's a, here's a figure of the monkey flower phylogeny. This is from Dean Grossenbacher and, and Justin Whittle's paper in 2011. And I, um, I put this here just to show that monkey flower is a great group to work in. In California, there's over 50 species. It's highly diverse. Um, its phylogeny is it's pretty well worked out, although there's areas um, that are still gray zones. And that's interesting because it means there, there's a lot of um, real-time evolution going on. So it's, it's a fascinating group to work in. Um, the species that I chose to work on is Mimulus lucinatus, the cut leaf monkey flower. It's known for having this um, dissected leaf margin. Um, and I chose the species just because I thought it was interesting. I thought I had an understanding of its species range, and I thought I could um, kind of easily go to the limits of its species range without traveling too far. It grows in the west slope of the Sierra Nevada. Um, it's specialized to these um, slow-flowing seeps. They're often granite seeps, but there are a few different rock types. Um, it's an annual, um, it, it develops rapidly in these little moths, uh, mounds, um, and it's really highly selfing. Um, and it's a close relative to uh, Mimulus cutatus. It's actually interfertile. A lot of populations are interfertile with a, a lot of other populations of Mimulus cutatus. But this just gives you a sense of its distribution. So in blue, we have Mimulus cutatus occupying a wide geographic range. We have um, in yellow Mimulus lucinatus, which is restricted to the west slope of the Sierra Nevada. Slides from Dina. Um, and then this shows you sort of its ecological distribution in the west slope this year. Um, so it occupies for being kind of a restricted plant, a range restricted plant, an endemic to California. 
it occupies a really wide breadth of environmental variation, right? You can find it in growing in chaparral in seeps uh, near 1,000 meters, um, through mixed coniferous zones, mixed um, montane forests, and, and it makes it all the way up to uh, subalpine environments. And so, in terms of the question of are peripheral populations unique or special, I mean, really, one only has to go and sort of grow them all together in greenhouses, right, to see um, what the genetic basis um, of, of different phenotypes is. And so this is just showing you a collection of plants. Uh, the seeds were collected in Yosemite National Park uh, along an elevation gradient from Hetch Hetchy here, um, going up an elevation along a tunnel area to Naya Lake, and then up to May, May Lake. These plants were all grown from seed about three months in a greenhouse, and they're all flowering, actually. So this is, this is a, just showing you the array phenotypic variation just in that one elevational gradient of four populations. And um, the lower elevation populations just seem to develop much faster. That seems to be an adaptation, perhaps. And so sometimes uh, the question arises, are range limits real? And what, what does that mean? And so one way that a range limit question can be answered is to, to transplant plants beyond the range limit and see what happens, right? And so this is just showing you some information um, about when we transplanted some populations um, beyond the high elevation range limit and at the, at the high elevation range limit, and just saw um, how many flowers they could produce, shown here in the number of pedicels. You can see that we, we uh, sowed about 6,000 seeds. We've got about eight plants to show up here, and, and, and nearly all of them could not produce flowers. So, so it seems to be a high elevation limit there. If we contrast this to the low elevation area of the species range, um, we see a very similar pattern. So there does be, seem to be some very strong selection going on um, just beyond the geographic range limits. Okay, so I wanted to show you this slide to um, orient you to some sampling so that I can, you, you can understand when I show you further graphs what I was talking about different areas of the range. So, we have the, the Licinianus main species range here. Um, if we zoom in, um, I'm showing various collections, and I'm putting in these little transect boxes that they will take and see. Um, the low elevation populations are in red, highest elevation populations are in blue, and I'll, I'm gonna refer to some garden, um, gardens where we grew plants in the field, and these are um, shown with these orange broken circles. So, in general, I'm just showing you the responses from seven populations here in three gardens, low elevation, central, and high elevation garden. And you can ask me more about fitness if you're interested later, but basically this is a scale of fitness as measured from flower production. Um, and what we see is we see broad climate adaptation here, okay? So the three highest elevation populations that are shown in light blue do better than the other populations when we're looking in the high elevation garden. Right? Um, we don't see much of a signal of adaptation um, here in the central garden. Uh, we see a lot lower fitness. Um, and then when we go to the lowest elevation garden, we see a flipped pattern where the, the low elevation populations do the best in this low elevation garden, with this one exception, right? Um, this low elevation population does quite, quite poorly. And that's actually the local population, okay? So that's interesting. And so that doesn't make much sense, does it? Well, it, it may because this is only one time slice that they did this experiment, right? If you go back and you reproduce this experiment over different years, different climate, uh, different you know weather years, you may get different um, responses. And actually, that does seem to be the case. I'm not showing those data today. But these circles show the local populations for each of these gardens. Um, and sort of the picture here is that you can almost find someone else doing better in your own place, even though you can, you can get a general signal of climate adaptation, okay? So um, I guess I won't blow the punchline on that right now, but, but just think about what that may mean for the conservation value of different populations. Okay, so um, I'm just skimming over some general broad results here, but we did experiments um, uh, using experimental gene flow, we basically made it different 
populations to each other, um, grew them in common uh, conditions, and then put them back out in the field in different places. Um, and here's us just planting them out back out in the field. And one of the things I just wanted to highlight, I'm not really showing you data here, but um, the biggest fitness to response that we saw when we grew plants here in one of the lowest elevation parts of the range and hottest climates um, was that this, this long distance gene flow, what we call edge to edge gene flow, was the most beneficial gene flow in our experiment, okay? And this is the population that I showed you that had a really low fitness at its own garden. And so the, the fitness ramp up from these experimental processes came from mating this population with a faraway population that was inhabiting a similar environment, okay? So the take home there, right, is that um, it's not just about how well a population does in its spot in C2 or how it does in another spot. We also have to think about the effects of gene flow, right, and, and what potential areas um, of the species range uh, may, may provide benefits. Okay, so just talking about, that's, that's some attribute information about peripheral populations. Um, I'll talk about a few other attributes. But I just wanted to touch on this abundance-centered hypothesis. Okay, this, this is an idea that's, that's permeated in literature and a lot of our thinking for a while. And it's pretty intuitive, right? Because the, the central part of the species range, you would guess, would have larger populations, right? It would be a healthier place to be. Um, outlier purple populations might be smaller. Um, they may suffer from um, drift or inbreeding depression, heavy selection, etc. cetera. Um, and and so, so this abundance center model has sort of cracked some of our thinking um, and created predictions and expectations. Um, another, so if, if peripheral populations are also, um, are, if they're small, they're, they're also an alternative to them being isolated is, just, is that they're actually overrun by genes from the central part of the species range. Right, sort of, sort of a swamping gene flow effect. So there's all there are alternative models to um, to address what may be happening at species range limits, right? And one one big idea is that um, this swamping gene flow may be something that actually creates a range limit because if we're looking at an ecological gradient. These large circles represent large populations. These small circles are small populations on the periphery. If we see a lot of asymmetric gene flow going from the central part of the range to the edge, um, those, those genes from the center may swamp the smaller populations at the edge, making them unable to adapt to those conditions and creating a range limit, okay? Very little empirical evidence about this, but these are very um, popular ideas about species ranges. And we don't see evidence for, for either of these in the, in the monkey flower system that I work in. Okay, so here's one example. So this is looking at abundance across the species range. If we go to, if we sort of index populations by whether they're more central or edgy in terms of their elevation, and we look at the plant density within those populations, we have a surprising result here that peripheral populations are actually the most abundant. Um, that's, that's strange. My, 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 you know, top idea on that is just that this elevation gradient that this plant inhabits in the Sierra, um, the wetter part of the range is the central um, uh, parts of the mountain. That's the higher precip areas, um, whereas the lower elevations and the higher elevations are that sort of dip in precipitation. Um, this species loves these bare granite rock areas. Um, perhaps it just has a harder time in the central part of its range. That's just an idea. So um, I'm just going to show you some results that were generated through a population genetic study of microstats looking at 23 populations that I showed on the map earlier. Okay, if we want to understand differentiation slash isolation across the species range, um, and we're looking at the lower elevations, the warm edges, and comparing them across the range to the cold edges, we actually see this wax is this genetic differentiation. I can talk to you later about how that's derived. But um, we see basically a flat pattern across the species range. The peripheral populations are not more differentiated than average, they're not more isolated than average. Um, 
And actually, this, this, is a, this is a graph showing you, again, the species range here is the Sierra running like this. Um, these lines in blue represent um, uh, it's relationships, gene flow relationships that are, that are long distance um, uh, and quite common in the species range. So, so these, are, these are these long distance gene flow events. It almost looks like a Pacific flyway to me. Okay, so it's telling us that there's a lot of genetic. Um, okay, there's a lot of genetic uh, interchange um, going this way across the species range. So among similar environments. Okay, um, so I, I think we can rule out the abundant center hypothesis <laughs> for this species. Um, what are the patterns of gene flow in nature, though? How do they move? Then? Um, so we, we did some statistics on just understanding if there were predictions um, to, to predict the genetic character uh, across the species range. And, and just the, the main result is that we found, that we found was that um, spatial distance is not very predictive of um, the relationships, uh, the genetic relationships among populations. Climate was actually um, more predictive than spatial distance. Okay, so, so populations with similar climates seem to be better connected. Um, okay, so getting it, getting it um, pretty much out of time, I think here, but um, getting at um, the causes of species range limits, I just wanted to, um, to, uh, to put out this idea that we, we, I think we rarely think about, and that one, one way that species kind of escape their range is to speciate, right? Populations can speciate out. And so I just wanted to highlight this, this study that was conducted by Dina and Sam Belos and myself. Um, we found that a lot of younger species pairs, we're seeing Mimulus cicadus here, Mimulus nidatus, um, uh, a lot of species pairs that have really different range sizes seem to be the youngest species pairs in, in monkey flowers, okay? And so this suggests that um, a lot of species are born um, with this really uh, asymmetrical difference in range size, range size. A lot of the populations in this, or a lot of the species pairs in the study um, Showed, showed this pattern of um, kind of sympatric speciation, right? So, so I just wanted to say, I don't want to uh, paint a picture where peripheral populations are important and central ones are not or something. Um, from, from what we can tell, a lot of species uh, are born within the ranges of other species, as far as we can tell. And, and Dina's going to be talking a bit more about species range size, about range sizes later today. Um, um, and, and I think I just going to end on this point, um, is that in searching the species range of Licinatus, we actually found another species, another cutleaf monkey flower. We named um, a fern leaf monkey flower here in, um, in Butte and Chip, uh, Plumas counties. Um, and uh, it occupies the same niche as Licinatus practically. It has the same selfing rate. Um, so it's a very, very similar natural history. Um, and this is showing that species range right here compared to Licinatus and some other closer relatives. But um, the interesting thing is it doesn't appear that Felicifolius is the nearest um, ancestor to Licinatus, nor are they the most closely related even in this set of species. Um, so it could be a convergent evolution. Um, but I guess one of the points is that, you know, there are over 2,000 endemic species of plants in California. If you had somebody um, running around exploring the ranges of each of those species, I bet we would shake out a lot more species out of the bushes, right? Um, even if these aren't each other's closest relatives. So peripheral populations are certainly worth exploring. Um, and I'm just going to shift to the end. Thank, thank a lot of people, and thank you for your